you look at that. So would you stretch your hands this way and ask the Lord to speak to us. Heavenly Father, I just ask that you would strengthen my, my voice and my body today, that you would allow your word to go forth, that I simply decrease and you increase, that the Holy Spirit would deliver this message as, as much or as little as he wants to, to add or take away whatever he desires, and that the thoughts you place in my heart that are burning in me will be placed in the hearts of this family, burning in them. And Lord, that we would join this fight for family and that this love that you have given us, this everlasting love, would burn in us to move us to acts of service and compassion. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As I said, this is kind of Valentine's month, and so we're going to look at love for the rest of this month. And this is Valentine's week. It is coming up on Tuesday. Husbands, it is coming up on Tuesday. Boy, y'all are in a very non-laughing mood. I'm, I'm, I'm up here laughing for no reason. I guess I'll just be happy. Valentine's Day is Tuesday. So, I wanted to kind of take today and talk about relationships and talk about uh, primarily the husband and wife relationship, but also just in general about the things that God is working and moving inside of me. As I said, I want this series to be allowing us to understand that God's love is perfect. The love of the Father to give His only begotten Son to us is perfect love, agape love. And until you and I can get that love in our hearts and allow that love to overflow into our relationships, we're never going to love people the way that God wants us to love. And we were designed to love. To live and to love and to love and to live. And we're not really living if we're not loving. And I know I'm talking to a group of people that most of you probably have been wounded in some way, form, or fashion in your life. And the enemy's told you not to trust. He's told you not to love again in some form or fashion in certain ways. But I'm telling you that's a lie from the pit of hell. And love is worth the risk. It is worth the risk for us to love one another the way God has called us to love one another. But we can never do that without having God's love in our hearts. And that love is no greater love, no greater love than a son of God who would give his life for me and you. Who would allow you and I to be with him forever, even though we had fallen. That none of us deserved it, but yet all of us can have it. That the love of God, the Father, the love of God, the Son, is the standard that's set for you and I to love one another. And also, I want us to look at today, because what I believe the enemy is doing to us as Christians, okay? I'm talking to Christians. I'm talking to people that believe God loves them. What I think the enemy is doing to us today, especially in this country, is he's trying to get us to focus on what we don't have so that we forget about what we do have. So today, whether you have a spouse or not, whether you've been in a broken relationship or not, whether you have your mother or father still on this earth or not, whether you have a good relation with them or not, I want you to see today what we have. That God chose the family to allow His Son to develop on this earth. That He was born into a family of a husband and a wife that they nurtured him, that he matured in them, and he grew, and even though he was not married, and he didn't have any children while he was on this earth, make no mistake, he was part of a family, a band of brothers that he lived with, that he grew with, that he went with, that he gave his life. So I want us to understand that we have so many more things in our lives in terms of family than we're actually realizing. And one of the things God wants to do this month is allow us to see those things and appreciate them more so that that would compel us to love one another more. And a family is not so much as to who is there, but what is there. A family is not so much as to who is there, but what is there. And that what is the love. The love of the Father and the love of the Son. That we're loving and we're living and we're learning we're allowing God to create an environment for us to belong, to grow, to live, to love, and be loved. So, 
I want us to be able to understand that what we don't have in a physical family, blood related or spouse, that the church can be a part of a family, that we just saw holes make covenants, covenant covenants to belong to this family. And I believe that everyone needs a place to belong. And I want us to look at the confines of a family where we have single mothers and they may need some help. We have people who have been through broken relationships and they need help. We have people who have been grieving over lost loved ones and they need help. And God has placed them in this family for you and I to help them. For you and I to love them. For you and I to see them through. Because we all know that life is one phone call away or one breath away for changing for us. And we will need someone to be our family as well. And so I want us today to focus on one love in particular. As I said, I want to just share a thought with you about forever love in just a minute. But also we're going to do this this, this month. As you begin to realize some things in your life that you appreciate, as you begin to get a revelation or you begin to have an event with your family and you want people to know that you appreciate your family or you want them to know that they can come and belong to this family, just share it. We have a wonderful new tool that God has given us in this world called social media that we can use for the glory of the kingdom of God. It's used for all kinds of things I know, but God can also use it for His glory and honor. So as you decide to do those things, we just got that hashtag, which is the sermon series title. You can use that there. But we're also going to look at our foundation scripture uh, for this entire series, okay? So our foundation scripture is pretty simple today. It's John 3.16. I'm going I'm to read, I'm going to quote the King James Version, because most of us have heard this scripture. We're in South Mississippi in the Bible Belt. Most of us have, but if you haven't. I'm going to share it with you today, and I'm going to share the King James Version, because that's the way I learned it when I was a child. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. But whosoever, whosoever, believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. But whosoever would believe in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. That love is the standard. That love is the foundation for every act of love, for every expression of love that you and I could ever do as a Christian. It should be bathed in that love, rooted in that kind of love, that agape love that we'll learn more about in the coming weeks. But today I want us to look at forever love. God said that everlasting life. And so that we have that ability to be there. And I just want to go ahead today and just talk to you about the biblical way that marriage is described in the Bible. It may not be popular, but it's true. Genesis chapter 3 says that a man shall leave his mother and father and he shall cleave to the wife. It's between a man and a woman. And it's meant to be the death of the apart. It's meant for us to grow. It's meant for us to love. It's meant for us to have children, if God so desires. And it's meant to be forever, till death us be part. And I know that the statistical rate that we have in America today is that over half of us who are married statistically will have a divorce. And that is the same in the church as it is in the world. No difference between Christians and non-Christians. I don't want to get into that today. I'm just statement to you as a fact. And so there's all kinds of reasons for that. Bad home life when you're young. Abuse. Unfaithfulness. Getting tired of giving up. There's too much strife, too much pain, too much hurt. All kinds of reasons. So let me give you the foundation of those reasons. Just like this foundation of Scripture is what family and love should be, John 10 says the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And so, if you've married in a church, you've made a covenant of God that you will love, honor, cherish, and obey. I know that there's new vows now that we rewrite those vows. 
So just because we rewrite them doesn't mean it changes the scripture. It is to be till death to you part. And if you don't know that, I'm not sure about that, you better recheck it till you get it. If I can talk you out of it, you don't need to do it. So I want us to look at and understand and know that Malachi says that God hates divorce. God hates divorce. One popular man, Rick Warren, in the church said that it is like a death in the family without the honor of a funeral when divorce happens. And I know no one gets married with the intent of getting divorced. I would hope that. But I will tell you today that things happen. That we live in a world that is not perfect and we are not perfect. And so wherever you are in your status today, whether you've been married before, whether you've been married multiple times, whether you're going through a divorce or whether you're thinking about divorce, I want you to hear this next three weeks before you make a decision on that. And also, I want you to know that God loves you where you are. That God hates divorce because it destroys his children. It hurts, it causes pain, it upsets families, it deplaces children, and it should never have been in the first place. And I am not here to guilt you out, I am here to lift you up and tell you that God is the God of restoration. He's the God of second chances. He is the God of peace and not of strife. And that you and I today have the opportunity to move forward in love. That we have the opportunity to the best of our ability. And God's going to give us ways to love one another as he has loved us. So again, don't focus on what you've done. The past is the past. As Teresa said, if you've asked for forgiveness, he doesn't even remember it. What I'm concerned about is what are you going to do today? Where are we going from today? Where are we going to go from here? And the biblical standard is that we love each other forever. That if we're part of a family, that we love each other forever. That it is forever love. And so, as I begin to go over these points briefly in just a second, I want us to realize and know that the enemy wants to destroy covenant. When you make a covenant with someone, the enemy wants to destroy that because he wants to prove to God that you and I can't keep covenant. So if you're having trouble in your marriage, the first person you need to look at is the person you say. And you need to get him out of your marriage and out of your house. And you need to begin to read the scriptures together, to begin to pray together, and allow God to move in and get him out. I've said this many times. I'll say it again here very briefly. That Teresa and I have a lot of arguments when I think she said something and she, think I, she thinks I said something. And when we finally get through the argument, we're saying, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Well, who said it? Well, I guess the nasty old devil twisted those words in the air and I heard it. But hurting people hurt people. Listen to me. And so he knows how to push your button. And he knows how to poke and prod. And he knows how to lay wounds back open that you haven't let God heal. And so if you're looking for offense, he's going to give it to you. If you're looking for something to hurt you, he's going to show you where to find it. And if you're looking to be a part of a faith family, he's going to show you something you don't like so you won't come back. But know today who the real enemy is. He wants to divide you, to separate you from the house of God, to separate you from your marriage, to separate you from your children. And he is a liar. He can do nothing but lie. He is a liar. And he needs to go back to the pit of hell. And he needs to be out of your life and out of your marriage and out of your family. And to the best of your ability, you need to do that and take authority over that. And so I want us to think about today in terms of love, that love is so much more than a physical experience. If we live long enough on this earth, the physical attraction will either fade or not work. Just leave it at that. Man, y'all are today. Let's just move on. So that's going to change over time. That's going to happen. That's a process of this fleshly body. But the love that I want to share with you today and the love that we have in our marriage and the love that we have in our families is an eternal love, a forever love. A love that will go so much further than the physical part of it. Because as we begin to love spiritually, we can love emotionally. As we begin to love emotionally, we can love physically. 
And that is the, the process that God wants to take us through, even in our marriage. Because when it starts out physically first, it gets off from the beginning. It is not what God intended for it to be. So it's important that we realize that. And so Satan loves to present something that looks like something that is not. The Bible says that angels of darkness will even masquerade around as angels of light. And the Bible says that he's very convincing in his deception. The Bible says that his antichrist, his counterfeit for Christ, at the last days will deceive many. And if the days were not cut short, he would even deceive the elect, the elite. So he's very convincing. And so for every good gift of God, for every gift that he has given his creation and humanity, Satan has a vile, disgusting, stealing, killing, and destroying counterfeit that looks shiny, that even looks better than the original. But when you get inside of it, when you begin to poke and prod it, or it gets a hold of you, you will realize that it is nothing but deception and darkness, and it will hold you longer than you wanted to stay. It will keep you. It will entrap you. And you need to pray for God to show you the counterfeits in your life. So the counterfeit of love is lust. And so today, I want us to look very quickly. The introduction is just as long as the point. So don't think, my goodness, when's he going to get to those points I see in my bulletin? Today, I want you to just quickly look with me about forever love in these terms. Loving, awful, valuable, and enduring. Okay? And I want us to look at those that God gave us a love that is for eternity. And that if we're going to have that kind of love, it is going to allow us to be living. I said love you, but living. It's going to allow us to be living a life that God wants us to live. It's going to allow us to be offering something that we could never offer before. It's going to allow us to value things the way that they should be, and it is going to endure the test. That's the kind of love you and I want. If I asked you, did you want that kind of love today? I don't think there would be anybody in this house that wouldn't raise their hand. Amen? <laughs> That's the love we're looking for. That's the love we want. So let's look at that in terms of the scripture that I've read you today. And let's look at that in terms and compare it against the counterfeit of lust. So let's go back to our original scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So let's look at living here, quick and briefly. So as I said, to live is to love, and to love is to live. God has called us to live. He created us to love. He made us that way with that capacity. And we're never going to truly be alive until we're able to love and give love. God made us that way. That's why the enemy wounds us so badly and hurts us and betrays us so much through people I know. But really, we don't fight against flesh and blood, the scriptures say. But we fight against principalities and spirits. So those spirits have wounded us and they have hurt us. And they have caused us not to be as open and innocent as we were as a child. And so it has come and it has damaged us. But make no mistake, the truth is God created us to love. To love. And that love should be forever. Loving each other forever. As I said before, love is so much more than something physical. It's a spiritual love that turns into something that is emotional and then it becomes physical. And my example for you today, real quickly here, is Adam and Eve. Look at that. Adam and Eve were partners in the garden. Adam and Eve were together. They were not together physically as we know husband and wife to be together today. And I'm not here to say the gift of sex is not a good gift. It is a good gift. But I'm here to tell you that when we get to heaven, Jesus was very clear that we don't know each other that way as husband and wife. We know each other differently. And some of you, that makes you sad, but I don't want you to be sad today. That's just a pit of hell lying to you again. We're going to know each other even better than we were before. Because we're going to be connected. Because we're going to be in that spiritual connection where we can actually be one with another. A collective group. And I don't want to blow your mind or get too much into this. But think about how God lives inside of you. What if we lived inside of each other? We were one collective body rejoicing in heaven, heaven all the glory. 
And we were receiving all this love. You see, that takes all the complication out of it. It takes all the flesh out of it. And that is the love that you and I need to have in our marriage. That is the love we need to have with our children. Is that unconditional love. That love that really makes us feel alive. That love that a, that a small child runs with their arms abandoned and you grab them up. That kind of love is what God intended for all of us to have. Even in the confines of marriage. And so Adam and Eve were not the way that they were after the fall. After they were deceived. And so God allowed the confines of marriage to make a covenant. So that we could still be a picture of the Trinity. Where we could be together. Where we could become one flesh. But we also have a third person in our flesh. And God is the head of the marriage. And I don't want to get into that too much. Because we covered that in October. But those three. That Trinity is in your marriage as well. Or it should be. God should be the head of your house. And your marriage. God made us in His image. And He wants us to love in His image. But you see, lust is not that way. Love is all about living. Lust is all about longing. Love is all about living. Lust is all about longing. It's never satisfied. You're looking for the next time and the next time. You're always aching. You're always jonesing for another kind of satisfaction of lust. Because it consumes you. Because it obsesses you. Because it is not what God intended it to be. It's a counterfeit. And it's made to destroy you. And so lust never ever allows you to be truly alive. You just look for the next opportunity to fulfill your lust. I don't want to get too deep into it. There is a, an account with David's sons where he wanted, one of his sons wanted one of his sisters and she begged him not to do it, but he took her. And he was aching. He told his friend before it happened, he said, I'm just aching, I'm hurting, I have to have her. The Bible says that once he had her, he hated her as much as he loved her. Because lust will kill and steal and destroy. Lust will never, ever benefit anyone, including you. You may think it will, but I guarantee you, it will destroy you. It will never truly satisfy. If it does, it's that one. And it's not true satisfaction. It is not the way we're created. And that's why you feel so bad after you finish it. It's because it is lust and not love. God made us in His image. And His image is unconditional love. Now let's look at all three. God gave God gave His only begotten Son. True love is all about giving. Forever love is all about giving. It's about giving into the relationship. It's about God giving that which was so precious to Him, which was most valuable to Him, that He could not pay a bigger price. It is about giving. It is not about receiving. But as we give, if those who are in relationship with us have that same mindset, then we are also receiving as we're giving. But the Bible says that it is more blessed and actually more fun to give than to receive. But if you're consumed by lust, it can only take. It will never give. It is only looking to serve itself. It only looks to satisfy itself. It is selfish. Where agape love, forever love, is selfless. And so I was getting my hair cut this week. Some of you may notice that. Chris said it was way too short. So, good news is it'll grow out. I like it to make it spring. You just don't do this and be done with it. But I'm in there and I'm talking to some folks. And all of a sudden we start talking about Valentine's and I'm checking out. And it comes up. Somehow, I've been married 24 years. And I said, somebody asked me about, well, how do you stay married that long? And I said, well, number one, she puts up with me. Number two, that when I focus on what I'm putting in the marriage, I'm totally satisfied. But when I'm focusing on what I get out of it, I become dissatisfied. Everybody in that room stopped. One girl in the back said, say that again! <laughs> say that again! said, okay, when I'm focusing on what I'm putting into it, 
then I'm always satisfied because I'm only concentrating on what I can give my brother. But when I began to take an account of what I'm getting, and I began to look at other relationships, and I began to say, well, so-and-so, and this, that, and the other, I become dissatisfied very quickly. And the girl in the back that said that went, mm, that's good, that's hard. And it is, right? It's really good, it's true. But it's hard. But the way to do that is love the Father first. If I love the Father, He will give me that kind of love. And if I'm not looking for my spouse to give me something that only my Father can give, you better get that. If I'm not looking for my spouse to give me something that only my Father can give, and some of you are doing that, your spouse is your God, and you're looking for them to become God in your life, and they'll never be enough. They'll always disappoint you. They'll always let you down. There'll never be enough time. There'll never be enough love. There'll never be enough cuddly, cuddly gifts, whatever your love language is. It will never be enough because God is only enough. And so you have to put God first, let Him fill you, and then you're so full, you're concentrating on giving. And I'm not saying you don't deserve to receive, but if they're doing the same, you're going to receive. You're going to receive it in abundance. Because it's all about offering. You see this picture that we chose up here. Life has a way of turning things upside down. And if we don't have that kind of love, and our love is only lust, it's only a physical, selfish kind of love, how can we ever offer and keep the love that God's called us to keep? Lust is selfish, ambitious, deceitful, and self-serving. But love is only about serving. We are called to love one another. Now let's look at value. I'm, I'm closing here very quickly. God gave the most precious gift. I'm not closing right now, so don't get too happy. God gave the most precious gift that He could give. He gave His Son. I mean, what kind of value can you place on the only begotten Son of God? But think about this. Jesus loved us also enough to become one of us. To live like we live, love like we love, but also to hurt like we hurt. To be betrayed like we've been betrayed. To be tempted in all the ways that we've ever been tempted. Yes, sin not. He chose that. He made that choice. It wasn't like God the Father drugged him. He volunteered for the assignment because he saw the Father's heart be broken. And so he thought you and I were worth dying for. Does that help you understand your value today? So as you begin to understand your value, and you begin to understand the value of those that he has placed in your life to love, then we begin to value ourselves because we have a trouble. We will never value someone else until we value ourselves. Well, that sounds selfish, Pastor. It's really not. Because unless you value yourself and know who you really are in Jesus Christ, you will never be able to function in a healthy relationship. And some of us forget the value that we have. And so we devalue ourselves by showing all kinds of things that were meant to be in private for our marriage night, or at least giving a little window dressing. As I said before, if you're really saying the store is closed, then stop putting stuff in the windows for us to look at. Okay? So it's time that we understand and know that we are valuable. That there are certain things that I have given to the confines of marriage, and that's where they should stay. And Teresa should view those as valuable, and I should view it the same. And that value of her is so much more precious than something physical. That value is emotional. That value is eternal. That value is my soulmate. And so if I know that kind of value is there, I'm going to search until I find it. I'm going to know that I know that I know that she's the one. And even though that I was lost as a goose, I knew how to get a hold of God. And I knew to ask Him for my marriage partner because I knew that it would be forever. I had been told that it should be forever. And although it was total hell for her the first 10 years because I had not sold my heart out to God, we always knew we were supposed to be together. So there's no discussion of being apart because we'll disobey God if we do. And so it's important to realize that there is a certain one for you. And why are you going to settle for your best when you can get God's best? Okay? And if it don't look like what it needs to, and it don't act like what it needs to, and nobody's perfect now, don't leave here and go give somebody the once over. Okay? But the Holy Spirit has a way of checking your spirit. 
He has a way of sending sirens into your life. And you're either going to deny that and say that love is blind, or you're going to go and get on your knees and say, is this the one, or should I expect another? Eh? Eh? Well, you don't want me stuck with a cow fit. Because once the night's down, I'm going to try to keep it tight. So you better know that you know that you know. It's time that we realize and understand that God has called us and He's created us to be one another and with one another. And some of us He's created to be one flesh. Some of us He's not. Paul said that. Some of us are, are, are created to be without a spouse for a season or, or maybe forever. God makes us differently. But you'll be okay with that. God will give you the reason so you're so full. Desperate people do desperate things. Amen? And they settle for things and they get blinded and they don't understand and know that God has a perfect plan. And some of us are out there, well, mercy, I better get back on my notes in a second, but I've got to say this before I do. Some of us are out there trying to find somebody to make you okay when you need to get okay before you find somebody. You know? It might be a hot mess. And ain't nobody going to help you with God. And if you're over here chasing Joe or Jolene, then you're not talking to God. Okay? Find something more disgusting, more risky 
more perverse to get the same pleasure that you got the first time. See what a poisonous snake pornography is. See it for what it truly is today. It's a bottomless pit and it will never be satisfied and it will never be filled up. Only forever love can defeat that kind of pit. But it can. Lastly, this forever love is enduring. It's not going to perish. It's going to be forever. It's the love that will call the hat. It's the love we're made for. It's deep down what we true, all, true, truly all desire today. Love that stands the test of time. The love that defeated the grave. Amen? Amen? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And if your spouse is going on to be with the Lord, you're going to know them in heaven. I don't want you to leave here today thinking it's not. But it's going to be so much better than the relationship we have there. And we're not going to argue because the Bible says there's no tears in heaven. Amen, Robert. When I don't have any stride, I'm going to be made perfect. Tracy won't have to get on to me no more. <laughs> I won't say who they are or call their names. But I was interviewing a couple the other night. I said, is there any problems we argue about? She said, well, he just won't do what, I did, what he tell him to do. <laughs> I got the same problem. <laughs> But I love her. And I try my best to tell her every day. She's the best thing that ever happened to me inside Jesus Christ. And she's my forever love. And I'm so glad. And you've got love that you need to give. And you've got love that you need to receive. And this love makes lust look like what it truly is. A consuming pit of darkness and fire. That is never satisfied. So in closing today, would you bow your heads with me? If you don't know the love of the Father that would give a son to you, if you don't know God in that way, if you don't know Jesus in that way, if you felt His love at any point in the service, you may not even know what that is. You may just simply be broken or your heart swelling or even burning. God is here to receive you today, to take you right where you are, to go ahead and forgive you of everything you've done up to this point, and allow you to begin the rest of your life with Him. He's that kind of God and He loves you with that kind of love. And Jesus would have hung on that cross if it was just you that was going to accept Him. He loves you that much. If you don't know Him in that way today, I pray that you will ask Him to forgive you of all your sins. That you will let Him wash you white as snow. That you just simply leave this place without your cares and your worries and your burdens. If you're caught up in some of this stuff and you're entangled, ask Him to free you. I'm just going to pray that He free you. If you know that your heart doesn't belong to Him, now is the time. Heavenly Father, as I pray for these who are asking for your forgiveness today, I pray that you free them from every entanglement of sin, that you break every chain, that your Holy Spirit minister to each and every heart and that there would be no one leave here without knowing they belong to you, God. And secondly, today I, I would ask in your own way to declare Jesus to be Lord of your life. He needs to leave. As you've heard me say before, Romans 10 and 9 says that you need to declare Jesus as Lord. You need to be able to know that He's raised from the dead and sitting at the right hand of the Father today. And He's praying for you as you pray right now. He's taking care of your debt. He's taking care of your bad record. And He's expunging every bit of it. What a glorious day it is. What a powerful day it is. What a free day it is. And lastly today, you're going to need to make a public statement at some point. Testify, be baptized, however the Lord leads you to do it. And so I want to give you an opportunity to with me to witness today. If you've made those decisions in your heart and you just want to start that step today, you simply raise your hand wherever you are. Heavenly Father, I thank you for peaceful hearts in the house. I thank you for your goodness and your grace. And I thank you for your sweet Holy Spirit that's moving on each and every one of us today. And so now I want to pray over you. I know it's a little late, but I want to pray over you today. I want to pray over those of you who have your loved ones that have gone. I just pray that the God of peace and comfort will give you peace and comfort today. 
that your Holy Spirit, Lord, would come and mend every heart, that you would fill them so full. And may I remind you that you have much left to do. God's going to show you over the next couple of weeks. Hang in here with me. God's got a great work for you to do, and your life is going to be full. Whether you believe it or not, your life is going to be full because he's got a lot for us to do as a faith family. How, what he's orchestrated is so powerful. So I just ask you to be encouraged today and hang in here with me for the next few weeks. And also today, for those marriages that may be struggling, you're going to never love like you need to love until you allow him to come into your heart. So that you can fill your life full of Him. And so if that's you, I want to pray for you today. Heavenly Father, I just ask today for those who are looking for people to give them what only you can give them. That they recognize that and as they open their minds and their hearts to receive today. That you fill them full of your love and your grace and your mercy before they leave this place. Now... I want to pray for marriages, okay? And the reason I pause there, I want to make sure I do it this way. The Lord wanted me to do it. If you're close enough to your spouse, and you know that I need to pray for your marriage, can you just simply reach over and grab her hand? I intended to call you up this morning, but the Lord wants to do it this way. If you're not close to your spouse, and they're not here with you today, that's okay. Take them by the hand when you get home. Take them by the hand and you see. Father, I just pray for every marriage. I pray for every covenant. I pray for strife to leave and love to come. I pray for those that are struggling financially that you give them wisdom in their budget. I pray that they bring the first fruits to you. I pray for those today who desire to have a child that you would allow their womb to be filled. And I pray that they have a peace about that, that that happens in your timing. And I pray today for those marriages who have grown cold to be rekindled. I pray this week as we celebrate one another on Valentine's Day that it would be a great day for each and every person. That we find ourselves in a spiritual manner. That we pray with our spouses in a spiritual manner. That we tell them how much our lives mean. Because they're in it. How much we're willing to offer to them. How much we value them. And may we declare that we have a forever love. And for those today who are looking. For those who are searching for their mate that you have for them. I pray that they get peace today in their heart and their minds. I pray that they find an overwhelming peace that you will not allow them to miss it. And I pray that you open their eyes to see exactly who and what is coming their way. And God, I pray for your perfect will over them and over their relationships. And I pray for this family today to have an enduring love, a love that lasts forever. And I pray that I live my life as an example of that with my family today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.